Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the June 14 regular meeting of the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. The meeting will now come to order. This is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all of the exhibits that are presented. Please notify the chairperson if you are unable to hear or to see the, the proceedings. The board works from a prepared agenda and will take up tonight's items in the following order. We'll have a roll call by Doreen Christ, Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not reading the agenda. <laughs> I'm sorry. Call to order, Pledge of Allegiance, roll call. Approval of minutes from the April 12th meeting. Approval of draft written decisions heard at the April 12th meeting. The appeals tonight are as follows. Number 2747 is a pra practical difficulty variance appeal by John and Jennifer Roan on Sextant Lane. And appeal number 2748 is a special exception appeal by Roxy Holmes and Ryan Libby. Then we'll have zoning board comments and adjournment. There are no tabled agenda items. In each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of the applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chairman will close the record and the board will adopt findings of fact for each criterion of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet that criterion. It is important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria have not been met, the board must deny the appeal or application. In many cases, the appellant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompted the request for the variance. Please understand that this is not legally relevant to the appeal, no matter how sympathetic the board may be to the appellant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criterion, a motion may be made to approve the appeal, and if there is a second, discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the findings of fact to support a decision on the motion. In most cases, the board will request that staff prepare a draft written decision based on the stated findings and conclusions, as well as the audio, video, and supporting materials in the record for approval at the next meeting. A general vote will then be taken on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members present vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date the vote was taken, regardless of the approval of a final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court, except as otherwise provided by law, within 45 days of this board's decision. Also, if anyone present at this hearing may wish to preserve your individual right to file any such appeal, you must be certain that this board's record evidences your appearance this evening and the basis for your support or opposition. Again, we remind everyone this is a public proceeding. You have the right to see and hear what is happening. All persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address or affiliation, and all board members and interested parties are asked to direct their questions through the chair. And Doreen, would you kindly do the roll call? Um, Richard Silken. <clears throat> I'm here. Kyle Noonan. Present. Christine Snow. Here. David Bork. Here. Joe Doherty. Here. And Michelle Stevenson. Here. Would you now join me in the Pledge of Allegiance?
Madam Chair. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Bork. Um, <clears throat> since we are short uh, one regular voting member, I would um, advise that it's, um, we need to elevate uh, our first alternate, Kyle Noonan, uh, to be a voting member tonight. We just need one. Okay. Does that need a second? Do we vote? Uh, I no. Kyle, welcome. I, think it's I accept. I think it's just a true discretion. Okay. There we are. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Um, now we're uh, looking at the approval of minutes. Does anyone have any changes or suggestions on the minutes from last meeting? Seeing none, do I take a vote on the minutes? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, make a motion to approve. Thank you. Second? I'll second it. Thank you, Michelle. All right, all in favor of accepting the minutes? Raise your hand. I'm going to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting. Okay. Okay, we've got four. Okay. Thank you very much. The minutes were approved. And now the – do we go through the draft decisions? And are you going to do that, or do I do that? No, you do that. Okay. i got to find them. All right, the first um, – What happened to 2742? So, so on the agenda, Madam Chair, yes. your first appeal uh, written decision is uh, appeal number 2743, special exception home occupation by Tracy Lane, 12 Arbor View Lane. On Appeal 2743, the special exception by Tracy Lane on Arbor View Lane. Do I read? Um, what you would normally do is, is, is say, does anyone have any changes, revisions, edits, things that they want to add to those written decisions? Does any anyone change? have any changes or suggestions for this item? And shall we vote? You now entertain a motion to approve. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. All in favor, please raise your hand. And now it's 2745. Madam Chair, again on that one, I will abstain because I was not at the meeting on the 12th. Thank you. On appeal 2745, Practical Difficulty Variance Appeal by Mary Joseph Keenan and Patricia Keenan Mills, 22 Pearl Street. Does anyone have any changes or suggestions on that item? May I entertain a motion? Mr. So moved. I second that motion. Thank you. All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. On appeal number 2746, special exception appeal by Matthew Winch on behalf of the Portland Rugby Football Club to Rod Road. Does anyone have any suggestions or changes? May I entertain a motion? Mr. Bork? So moved. And a second? I second that motion. Thank you, Kyle. All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. I assume Mr. Silkman abstained on the last he two. He did. Yep. He's okay. been abstaining. And so the motion passes. The motion passes. All right. And now we move right into our first petition of the night. Yes. 
Mr. Longstaff? Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, the, the uh, first uh, appeal tonight is Practical Difficulty uh, Variance Appeal by John and Jennifer Wrong. And uh, the appellants have a uh, 0.34-acre subject property, single-family dwelling. It was built in 1971, according to the assessor's records. The lot is non-conforming with regard to the required lot area, and the dwelling is non-conforming with regard to the front and rear yard setbacks. The parcel is not in a shoreland overlay or special flood hazard area. The appellants um, are proposing to have a vertical addition added to their existing one-story attached garage to accommodate additional living space. Um, as the site plan shows, part of the garage is encroaching into the front setback. Uh, it's a legally non conforming existing uh, situation and they therefore um, because it, it uh, encroaches into that setback they need a, a practical difficulty approval in order to expand vertically and now will we take a presentation from the petitioner okay is the petitioner here please state your name and address Good evening. My name is John Roan, uh, and I am the homeowner at Two Sextant Lane. Uh, and my wife Jennifer and I are uh, applying for this practical uh, difficulty variance in order to add additional living space above our existing one-story garage. Um, as Mr. Longstaff stated, uh, the house was built in 1971 um, and is existing. Uh, currently within the setbacks of, uh, of what are required for today. Um, and so in order to uh, expand above that, we would need the, the approval of this variance. Um, I have met with a builder and uh, what we would like to do um, is really just add same footprint, just add a second story above. Uh, the only new footprint at all would be um, converting a brick walkway that currently exists uh, and just covering it, making it, turning that into a covered porch. Uh, the rest of the structure would be uh, on the exact same existing footprint. Um, meeting with our builder, we currently can rebuild on the same footprint without having to do additional foundation work, uh, which obviously is a uh, tremendous cost savings. Uh, any variance or any deviation from that footprint would require significant uh, additional um, foundation work, which would require excavation, uh, significant concrete costs, things like that, uh, and would uh, drastically increase the overall cost of the project. Um, I have rough estimates uh, after meeting with uh, our builder and having an excavator uh, team come and look at it that um, having to redo the foundation on that area, on that size footprint would be somewhere in the magnitude of $40,000 uh, material cost. You know, that could, that could vary, of course. Um, but that's obviously a significant increase on top of what we currently are estimating to be a hundred and twenty-five to maybe a hundred and fifty thousand dollar project um, if we're able to just rebuild on the exact same footprint that we're currently occupying. Chair, I have a question for Mr. Rohn. Certainly, Mr. Bork. Uh, Mr. Rohn, I, I noticed that the uh, covered walkway actually extends the footprint of the building out and makes the um, building even less conforming because there's further encroachment uh, to the front side back. Uh, is this absolutely necessary to your plan? It's not. Um, honestly, we would move forward with the, the plan without that. Um, there is an existing walkway there now. Uh, so the the additional encroachment would be really just the roof over um, that, but that is certainly not a, a deal breaker for us. We would like to include that. Um, looking in our neighborhood, there are lots of other places that have covered walk or I'm sorry, covered porches. Um, so you know we would like to be able to incorporate that. And given that we already had to ask for a variance in order to do anything, um, we thought we would ask for that as well. Um, but certainly not required. Okay, uh, just follow up on that. 
by asking for this, you're making it less conforming. And I just want to make you aware of that because uh, it will have uh, repercussions on our decision. Um, so if you're willing to yield on that, then that certainly is an important factor. Uh, secondly, uh, do you have direct access from your garage into the home? Yes. You do. So there's really no need for that walkway as far as your ingress, egress? Correct. We, we can access the house from the garage. Yes. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. I'd like to ask Brian a question on that. Brian, if the walkway is not directly connected to the house, is it considered a structure or is it a portico? And I'm wondering if there, an option might be to separate the walkway from the house six inches and create the exact same covered porch, but not have it, con not have it be a non-conforming structure because it would no longer be a structure. Well, I think technically it still would be a, a structure because it would be affixed to the ground. It would be affixed to the earth and it would be something man-made constructed on the site. But that, I mean, aren't you allowed to build porticos and <clears throat> gazebos and things like that well, that are gazebos um, trellises those kinds of things are more landscaping features whether you connect this to the house or not That's the good. use is really the same okay thank you i have a question mr longstaff this is a um a corner lot so it has two front yard setbacks what is the side yard setback for The side yard setback would be half the required front setback, which would be 20 feet. But that, that's on the other street, not, not the street that he's asking, not the frontage okay. that he's that asking. Yeah. Um, Madam Chairman, can I ask a question of the applicant? Certainly. Um, Mr. Rohn, do you, I know you didn't buy the property in 1971, but is there some, do, do you know why the house was built at the angle that it was? Is there something about the lot that required the house to be built that way? Unfortunately, you're right. We don't know exactly. We just bought the house last summer. Um, so we've been in the house for about a year now. Um, I've talked to neighbors that have been in the neighborhood for many, many years. Um, and what I can gather is our house and the house directly across a uh, sextant from us were built in the early 70s before the rest of the sextant lane was actually completed. Uh, so they were actually more on gun stock than sextant. And then the rest of the road was completed and the rest of the houses on sextant lane were built in the 80s. Um, so I, I can't necessarily confirm that, but that's what we've been told. Um, if you look at the other houses on the street though, most of them are built square to the road, so it, I'm not really sure why they chose to build it at an angle across the lot like they did. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, can I ask one question? Yes. <clears throat> in the application, we may be going through this in a few minutes, but I just, if we are, I can hold off. But the application seems to indicate that there's a 40 foot required setback, and it's, going from 40 feet to 21 feet, but the drawing shows it from 27 to 21. Could I have some clarification on that, or was it just added after the fact? M Madam Chair, if I, if I may, um, the 40 foot is the legal requirement now. The current existing footprint is already only 27 feet back from there. Okay, so in the in A where it says our existing garage exists within the current 40 foot, I see, okay, I was reading that differently. I understand now. Thank okay. you very much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Rohn. Is there anyone else here to speak on this petition? Hold on. Hold on. Mm -hmm. we, he needs to go through the criteria. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Stay right where you are. <laughs> okay. That's it. 
Okay, so leading us through the criteria. Question one, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Mr. Rohn. Yes, so uh, as stated, the house was built in 1971 um, and is currently non-conforming to the required setbacks. Um, this was based on a decision that the builder made uh, 52 years ago um, and not anything that is um, current to uh, decisions that have been made uh, recently. Um, it does, as I stated also, I, I don't know why the builder chose to build it at the angle that he did um, when most of the other houses in the neighborhood, but that is really the, the issue here is it was built at an angle kind of across the lot as opposed to um, square to the lot. Thank you. Item two, the granting of a variance will not produce any an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Uh, so most of the lots in this area are about the same size, so they tend to be about 0.3 to 0.4 acres, which is what our, ours is 0.34. Um, although within that, uh, we do have one of the smallest footprints of the existing houses in that area. Uh, if you look at finished square footage, um, our current square footage is one of the smaller ones in that, um, that general area, at that neighborhood. Um, and what we're proposing would be um, to really just add the vertical height to the existing garage, um, which is not out of uh, conformance with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, at all, at least in our opinion. Thank you. Item three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Uh, so again, as stated, the, the builder uh, back in 1971 um, built this house at an angle across the lot um, instead of building it square on the lot. Um, and so that decision, and that decision alone is, is impacting this uh, to this day and, and nothing that any uh, future homeowners to include my wife and I have done could, uh, could have impacted that. Thank you. Number four, the other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. No other feasible alternative is available. Uh, so as I stated earlier, requiring uh, the garage to be moved within the uh, current setback requirements uh, would require significant foundation work, uh, which our current project would not require. Uh, so that's a significant cost increase, um, roughly almost a third probably uh, additional cost uh, on the project in order to move it into the, the uh, current conformance. Um, it would also, so in addition to the, um, the additional foundation work, it would require reworking how the garage attaches to the current house uh, because it is a fully attached garage right now um, in order to maintain that access from the garage into the house and, and have those two structures marry up. It would create a, an odd angle of the house, uh, which would also complicate the roofing structure instead of just kind of being a, a straight roof line, it would be a, a significant angled roof. Uh, so there are significant other costs in addition to just the foundation work that that would require. Thank you. Number five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. So as I mentioned, uh, the lot size is, is approximately the same for most uh, houses in that neighborhood, uh, although we do have one of the smaller footprints, so adding that additional living space above the garage uh, would bring the house actually closer in, um, to the, the houses in the surrounding area. Number six, the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. 
So actually, um, granting the variance would uh, significantly lessen the impact. Uh, not granting the variance would uh, require significant groundwork and that type of thing, which uh, the current project would not require uh, by rebuilding on the same foundation. Item seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area as defined in 38 MRSA 435 or flood hazard zone as defined in the town of Scarborough floodplain management ordinance. That is correct. Uh, the house is not located within, within any of those uh, protected zones. And number eight. Please demonstrate how the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of this property that is permitted in the zone in which it is located and would also result in significant economic injury to the applicant. So again, we are looking to um, add the second story to add additional living space. The house is uh, I believe it was actually listed as a four bedroom house. Um, however, two of those bedrooms are extremely small. One of the quote unquote bedrooms is actually a seven by seven room with no closet in it. So not even a legal bedroom. Um, so really it's a three bedroom house and the, that third bedroom. So if you go from four, one of them is a seven by seven room. The other room is 10 by seven, which is a little bit bigger, but still quite small for, uh, you know, for a bedroom. Uh, it does have two kind of standard size bedrooms as well. So um, many of the other houses in our neighborhood are three, four, five bedroom houses. Um, what we would add in the proposed addition would be uh, two additional bedrooms, which would really take it to a true four bedroom, arguably four, five-ish bedrooms, so four, kind of four and a half bedroom uh, property, which is uh, certainly not out of line or, um, you know, not, not allowed in, in that area. It would um, be similar to other houses in the area. Um, th we did talk uh, briefly about the covered porch. Um, many other houses in the area have a covered porch. Um, if our house had been built in 1971, square on the property, there would be probably no issue with having a uh, covered porch on that house. Um, but again, uh, we would be willing to yield uh, on that, that particular point. Um, the, uh, the, in terms of economic injury, so as I outlined right now, we're estimating uh, with our builder that the project is um, probably gonna cost, assuming we get the variance and can just rebuild on the current footprint, 140 to $150,000. Um, if we have to move the garage into a conforming area, uh, the additional work to uh, pour a new foundation, uh, to create the angled roof and rework the connection between the garage and the, um, and the existing main house would uh, be in the ballpark of 40, 50, maybe even uh, more, 40 or 50,000, maybe more depending on exactly, because we, we don't have plans drawn up for that, so we don't know exactly what the, the cost increase would be. Uh, but it would be a, a significant increase uh, of, you know, at, looking at probably 33% increase in the total project cost. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually have another question. Certainly. Um, what's the reason for, for putting the proposed portico facing Sexton? rather than on the other side of the house, on the east side of the house? Is that just aesthetic to be facing the street? Do you mean on the, the still the front of the house, but the other side of it? No, or, um, well, I guess if we're looking, if the front of the house faces Sexton, is, is why put it there rather than on the, on the back side, that is on the other side of the house, the side of the house facing, facing the abutter. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. Um, 
Really just be, to have a, a front porch. A front porch. Uh, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, there is an existing deck on the back porch or on the back side of the house already. Okay. Um, so we do have, we do have that, mm -hmm. um, just like the aesthetics and um, functionality of having a front porch area. Any other questions? Oh, Madam Chair, I might just offer, just for consideration, for both the applicant and the board, that should you approve the required relief for the vertical expansion, just looking at the boundary survey, if you projected that parallel with the street, it could potentially allow a small porch, maybe not the, the entire length of the front of the, the garage, but enough to give you a small porch at the door, at the mm -hmm. entry door, which, you know, if you're, if you're going to stay, say, and, and again, this is an if, I'm not, I'm not leading the board, but if you were to approve, say, the 27 foot setback for the vertical extant, expansion, that 27 feet could be projected parallel and whatever that that would give him something to work with as far as a covered entry on that front side of the house. It, you know, it's something to consider. It might not be the, yeah. the whole enchilada, but you get a bite of it anyway. Absolutely, thank you. Mr. Longstaff, can the petitioner sit down now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Rome. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this petition? Okay, thank you. Hearing none, we're going to take it into committee. Anyone want to begin this discussion? Mr. Madam, Bork. Madam Chair, were there any written correspondence? None on this petition. Madam. There was no written correspondence. Thank you. I'd be happy to offer my sort of general thoughts. Um, I, I think all of the criteria are met as to the vertical expansion above the garage. I'm not sure that the front porch uh, meets criteria number, criterion number four, no feasible alternative. Um, though I do think that the front, the proposed front porch expansion does meet the rest of the criteria. Would you state that again, Mr. Noonan? Sure. So I think that- Just your last statement. I missed, I missed some of the work. So the, the front porch, I do not believe it meets criterion number four, no feasible alternative. Um, but I do think it meets the rest of the criteria. And I do think the garage, the vertical expansion of the garage does meet all of the criteria. Those are my thoughts. Thank I you very welcome much. welcome others. Shall we start by going through number one? Need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Ms. Stevenson? Yeah, um, I think that he demonstrated, the applicant demonstrated pretty well. It, the house is built in the 70s. Uh, 1971 to be exact, and uh, it was built on an, on an angle um, for un unknown reasons. So it um, set blacks, the codes were different, and um, I think that this is shown to be a unique circumstance for needing the variance. Thank you. Anyone else on item one? Number two, Mr. Bork. Uh, yes, uh, I, I would agree with uh, Ms. Stevenson, um, and I would uh, further add that um, this is certainly a, a, a unique positioning of a house on a lot compared to the other homes around it. In fact, there are only two homes, uh, theirs and the one 
across the street, if I'm not mistaken. They're situated this way. The rest of them are all square on the lots, uh, which makes this particular uh, piece of property unique um, compared to the other homes in the development. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment on item one? I too feel this is a unique circumstances. In addition, he has a corner lot, which means he has two front yard setbacks. That creates a whole nother level of difficulty. Number two, the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect. <clears throat> Madam Chair? Yes. Should we vote on criteria one? Oh, well, should we? Have we I beg it? your pardon. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yes. Sure. All right. So we're going to vote on criterion one. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. And getting back to the undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, it will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Someone want to address item two? Mr. Bork. Uh, I think this will actually make the house more conforming to other homes in the uh, development. Uh, as the appellant uh, noted, there are larger homes, more bedrooms, et cetera, and this would um, bring it more into conformance in that regard and will, in fact, increase property values surrounding it. Very good. Any other comments? All right, shall we take a vote? All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Number three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Any discussion? I think we all concur. All in favor? Thank you. Number four, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Any comments? Mr. Bohr. Uh, the applicant has uh, provided um, uh, evidence from, is verbal evidence from his builder regarding the cost differential. Uh, and uh, while that's very good and it seems reasonable, uh, it would actually be better if we had something in writing uh, in cases such as this. Um, I, I still feel, though, that um, it, the numbers quoted make sense. They're logical. And I think on the basis of that, I would support it. Uh, and then regarding the, the porch, uh, I would be very amenable to, uh, if, the, if, the, if the applicant were to alter the design of the porch so that it does not encroach the 27 feet setback that currently exists. Okay, I think that would make sense. Uh, in fact, it would actually give coverage to that portion of the sidewalk, which is directly in front of the front door, um, and provide some kind of, you know, protection for people entering that way. Uh, and the the applicant has already stated that um, uh, he is willing to do so, uh, and I thought that was a very good idea that was proposed by, by Kyle is to uh, be able to uh, make it a, well, actually, no, it was not. Brian. It was Brian that did it. Thank you, Brian. Brian <laughs> <laughs> no. Ms. Stevenson. I agree with what Mr. Noonan and Mr. Work were saying about number four. Um, and I don't know if we need to make a certain, uh, like amendment or whatever Would it to be it. A condition. Yeah, condition. Thank you. Uh, um, to say that we would be okay with a 27 foot setback. I think that will still give you a decent sized porch, but I could be wrong. But if that's something that you want us to do. Well, no, I actually. Any other comments about this item? All in favor with the condition, please raise your hand. 
something like and, that. And just so we're clear, the condition is the porch conforms to the existing 27 okay. foot setback. That's okay. how I understood it. Okay. Right, Dorian? Got it. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we can restate that as well on the up and down vote of approval or, or okay, thank you. Uh, number five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. <clears throat> well, it seems pretty clear from the evidence that's been presented that adding the second story will actually make the property more conforming <clears throat> with the surrounding properties, not less. So I think this criteria has been adequately met. Any other comment? All in favor? Number six, the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Any discussion? Actually, uh, by granting the variance, uh, as the applicant has pointed out, it has less negative effect on the environment than building a new garage that would be in conformance with the setback. So um, this actually has a very positive effect on the environment. Thank you. Any other comments? All in favor? Thank you. The property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area or flood hazard zone as defined in the Town of Scarborough Floodplain Management Ordinance. Mr. Longstaff? Madam Chair, I can confirm that the property is not in the shoreland zone or a floodplain. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? It was five in favor, none opposed. And number eight, please demonstrate how the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the zone in which it is located and would also result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Any comments? This one, thank you. This one usually gets me, but I think that you've demonstrated while Mr. Bork did say that it would be nice to have something in writing, that it would cost you a lot more to do um, pour new foundation and everything. Um, this seems like the most feasible option um, that will be the most economic for you as well. Mr. Bork? I would further state that, it, that um, the applicant has agreed to submit the porch covering um, to be in conformance with a 27-foot setback, uh, which would help uh, keep the property within the existing nonconformance. It doesn't add to the nonconformance. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to take a vote. All in favor? Five zero, as with all the other items on this, on this um, variance. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. I'd now like to take a vote of approval on the variance applied for by Mr. Brown. I'd, I'd like Madam to Chair, entertain a motion. That's I was just going to say, I'll, I move to <clears throat> approve the variance application. Thank you. Second? Thank you. Second. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Can I, can I, I'm yes. sorry to hijack this. That's should, all right. Should we approve it subject to a condition? Condition. Yeah. And I, so I don't know if we need to withdraw the motion or amend it here, what the proper procedure is. Okay. We've already approved it with a condition, so if we approve the application, we've approved it with a condition. Is that how that? If, that's how I would. That's it. how. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
All right, I'd like to accept um, uh, a full vote of approval for this petition, including the condition which we placed on the setback of, of the porch. Is there a second? Oh, yeah. I second, I second that. Yep, Michelle was the second. Okay. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Further discussion? You ready? Here we go. All in favor, please raise your hand. Five in favor. Thank you very much. Sure. Sorry, this is uh, John Roan again. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, just because I'm new to this process for the written um, approval, just so I can have that on record, is that what will be approved at the next meeting? And then I can get a copy of that after it's been approved next meeting? Okay. The vote taken tonight is approval for your petition, but you'll receive the written approval later. Actually, what you'll receive within the next week or so, you'll receive a certificate of variance approval, which you need to record at the Registry of Deeds, Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. You need to do that within 90, day, 90 days 90 days of approval. Uh, you'll also get a letter that states that your, your um, variance was approved by a vote of five to nothing. The certificate is what the Registry of Deeds is going to want to see. Okay. Um, and and uh, that, that will all be notarized and everything. So that's, that's your official document that gets recorded. Okay. Your letter describes what happened here tonight. The, the written decision that we're talking about and the ones that we approved tonight are just a form. You heard discussion. It formalizes that in, in writing for each criteria, and that goes into the record. But that's voted on at the next meeting because I have to draft that up tonight. Sure. But the decision you will receive within the next seven to ten days. By certified mail. By certified mail. <laughs> <laughs> so be, you can okay. be looking for that. Thank you very much. Moving right along, we'll go to our next item. We have a special exception permit application, number 2748, for a property located at 147 Old Blue Point Road. And Brian, would you please? And is the petitioner here for that item? Uh, so the second appeal tonight um, is by Roxy Holmes and Ryan Libby at 147 Old Blue Point Road. Um, they own a single family dwelling there and the property. It's in the R2 residential two district. The parcel is non-conforming with regard to the lot size, but it is conforming with road frontage. The existing buildings appear to be conforming with regard to all setbacks. Um, the applicant wishes to establish a home occupation to sell uh, shellfish, lobsters that are caught by the homeowner. Um, normally, they, if they just wanted to operate a shellfish business out of their house, uh, they wouldn't even need to be here. But if they want, wish to sell the, the catch at their house, that kicks them into the home occupation. It's just a kind of a, uh, a minute difference. They could, they could store lobster traps and they could conduct fishing, and bring their catch home, and then they could take it to market or do whatever from there. No home occupation. To sell out of the home, home occupation. So they're here for that. Okay. All right. Are we ready to hear from the petitioner, Brian? Yeah. So just 
Mine up. Madam Chair, yes. just to clarify that yes. this is a permitted use within this zone and when approved as a special exception. Is that correct, Mr. Longstaff? Correct. Well, okay. it's, it's, it's not a permitted use. It is a permitted special exception use, yes. but, but not a permitted use by right. True. As a, yeah. So, so right, it, that's why it needs it. this approval. It needs to Got come it. before the board for a special exception. No, no I understand yeah. that. But, the, you know, there was a letter that came through that claimed otherwise. Well, I think what the point was, I think, and we can get into that okay. deeper, I think they're just trying to make the point that it's not a commercial. Retail sales is not a permitted use in the R2 zone, except if it's associated with a, an approved special exception home occupation. It's a distinction. Are you Ms. Holmes? Okay, come on up and identify yourself and give your address, please. My name is Roxy Holmes. Do I need to hit this or is it on? Okay. I saw him push a button when he came up here before, but maybe <laughs> maybe it was just preemptive. Um, name is Roxy Holmes. Reside at 147 Old Blue Point Road with Ryan Libby. He is the um, actual homeowner. Um, he's at home with our daughter right now. Um, so he has also applied and signed the application as well. He is a commercial lobsterman, fishes out of Portland. Um, we have a five-month-old daughter, which prompted me to want to leave my corporate job to be able to stay at home with her. Um, she went to daycare for a short period of time um, and trying to figure out something else that we could do to still have an income for me. Um, and this was a solution to that so that I could raise my daughter at home while she's young um, and still have some sort of income to do that. So we live at 147 Old Blue Point Road right behind Bailey's Seafood Restaurant and Bailey's Ice Cream. They are within side of our front house. Um, the lobster retail shop, if you will, um, will be set up in the garage. And I actually printed out another um, form when I submitted this. It was very last minute previously. Um, so I have the more clarifying of what the actual dimensions would be. If you would like, I brought copies for everybody um, as far as the size. In the garage, um, it's a 24 by 24 garage and we'll be using half of the garage um, bay for that. The lobster tank um, is 12 feet by four feet by four feet. Um, it will be placed, or it is placed, we're halfway set up with it right now um, in the process of getting it set up um, in that quarter of the bay in the garage um, and would be selling from there, um, obviously it's close proximity to Pine Point. So right now it would just be, you know, word of mouth, putting a sign out front. It's not gonna be anything disastrous to the area. There's lots of other um, lobster pound home occupation um, in the area. Turner's Lobsters is right around the corner in the same residential zoning district if you pull it up on the map. Um, so there are other families who are doing this um, in the same zone, it has already been accepted use in the zone, even though it's not a conforming use, as you've said. Um, so that's kind of the gist. I can go down the points. I'm not sure, you know, how, would you like me to just go down each We'd point? We'd like to go through each item, how the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, and other aspects of its design or operation? Um, so the lobster tank, as I said, it's, um, you know, a 12 by 4 foot tank. Um, it's a couple hundred gallons. Don't need the exact gallon amount on it. Um, but it's self-contained. It has a biofilter. So the filter, um, it you take the bacteria from the lobsters to create its own environment. There's no added chemicals. There's, um, you know, it's, it's a self-contained ecosystem. The lobsters produce their, um, as they discharge, you know, their stool and whatnot, it creates the bacteria um, in the filter that it grows on the rocks on the bottom. There's like a bio pad and you can change the water out, you know, every few months as necessary. We'll, we'll be bringing in salt water that's pumped, you know, salt water from the ocean, bringing it in. So there's not like any outside system, there's no runoff, there's not gonna be anything that would be impacting the environment in that way. 
The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Yeah. So we have a, the driveway technically holds four cars. Um, my car will be parked in the other bay of the garage. So we can have a minimum of two dedicated parking spaces on the paved driveway and the walkway that goes into the door in the side of the garage, it's all paved. Um, they don't have to cross any kind of street to go back and forth. Um, the road that we live on also um, is on the same road as like a ballpark. Peterson ball field is in the same area. So um, it's not a super like overly busy area, you know, it's, it wouldn't create any more hazards pe than people, you know, pulling into the house and back out. There's no hazard in, in driving. If somebody's licensed to drive a vehicle to come to purchase lobsters, it wouldn't create any additional hazards. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. I don't foresee this having any impact on fire or police response. Like I said, Bailey's is the on the opposite side um, of the road, Bailey's Ice Cream and Bailey's Restaurant right there, um, having people coming to purchase lobsters from the garage is not gonna you know, increase any, any municipality response. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Nope. Again, the driveway and the walkway are paved um, so I don't foresee any issues of erosion from the extra traffic coming in. It is a paved way for, for walking. E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, it will be compatible with existing uses um, in the residential zone. Like I said, Turner's Lobsters is right around the corner um, up off of Pine Point Road, and it's in the same residential zone. Um, so that is, you know, other, other um, families in the area are conducting the same business. Um, there's no change to the building structure. There's no additional construction taking place. There's no um, major changes. Um, with the exception, if this is approved, um, to put a small f sign out front. And I know I talked to um, Dr. or uh, Mr. Longstaff, excuse me, um, previously about signage um, requirements. So I know there's a lot of rules about signage. So um, of course we'll we'll fall within the rules of that um, once we get there. So we don't have anything made up yet. But in the event that we put anything out front, we'll make sure that it falls in the, the guidelines. F, if located in a shoreland zone as depicted on the Town of Scarborough official shoreland zoning map, the proposed use will comply with all of the requirements of the Town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance. Uh, we are not in either of those zones. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ryan is co-applicant, and he is the homeowner. H, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Yes. <laughs> I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation? Um, previously said we won't create any additional noise or disturbance within the neighborhood. Um, it will be, I anticipate, you know, potentially a few customers a day, if that. I don't expect some big booming business, um, but just want to have the option rather than having to deliver off-site if somebody wanted to come purchase from the house to be able to have that um, availability. Um, 
between the ballpark, I can hear Ken's. I know you guys were talking about Ken's earlier. We can hear the announcements from Ken's restaurant at our house. There's not going to be any impact. We're not going to be making noise to, you know, the neighbors in any way. Um, can hear seafood announcements from up the street and ice cream announcements from across the way, and we won't have any generation of noise to that aspect. Mr. Bork. Yes, I have several questions uh, uh, for uh, Ms. Holmes. <clears throat> so um, you mentioned only a few customers a day. What, have you done business projections in order to determine how many customers you'll be serving per hour during your peak hours? Um, I have not done. I'm not really sure where to start with that. This, like I said, um, I just came off of working a corporate job so I could stay home with my daughter. And yeah. um, and this is, you know, the very beginning steps of this. And to be able to do this um, and get a better idea of what that would look like. All right. So Mr. Libby is the lobsterman. Yes. How long has he been in business as a lobsterman? His entire life. His father is okay. also a lobsterman. So how is he selling now? Um, he sells to... Um, down at the pier there. I'm drawing a blank on the name, but there's a lobster dealer that he delivers to every a day. A wholesaler? Yeah, the wholesaler down at Got the it. end of the wharf. Right, so will he, main, will he maintain his wholesale business and establish, yeah. a, is that the proposal? Yeah. So he, establish a retail business on top of that? Yeah, so he intends to still sell to the wholesaler, and then this will just be kind of on the side um, so that I could have a small income. Okay. Um, now, you, you state that there are, at least two parking spaces in the driveway. Is that true? Yeah, there's um, actually four vehicles fit in in yeah, the driveway. Yours would be parked inside the. Mine garage. would be in the garage. Yep. Right. You know, so that would, and, and I noticed you you did mention that you had a plan for the layout of the garage, which mm -hmm. you know the, the garage is actually nearly 600 square feet, and uh, the, the maximum allowed for retail is 400. Yep. So you, what you're saying is you you're dividing the garage off. In such yes. a way that um, only part of the garage Correct. Is, for, is the resale? Yeah, and we're not putting any physical divider <clears throat> up, but the, you, you know how there car, there's two bays in the garage, so it will just be the half side. Um, so the square footage for the home is uh, 1,564 square feet per the assessor. 20% um, of that is 312 feet. Half of the garage is 288 square feet, so it falls within the 20%. Um, well, it's, it's actually it's 400 square feet for retail is the maximum. That's the criterion. Right. Yeah, so it would fall within that, you know, by subdividing the garage. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I also saw something um, in the, I'm not sure if it was the ordinance itself okay. that said 20% of the overall floor space as well. All right. Now, one other question regarding uh, the road. Um, I, I believe this is a fairly narrow road, and there's not a, a lot of... Um, room for cars to pass is that true uh, well there's a sidewalk on one side um and it there's a shoulder we walk our dogs our neighbors a few few houses down they park on the sidewalk and you know you can pop out into the road and go around them so um, cars do park on the sidewalk a few houses down they do on a regular basis yeah okay so, so we, we you, don't intend you anticipate to anticipate that some of your customers might park on the sidewalk also um no i anticipate that they would park in the driveway where the spots are open. How available. would you control traffic? If there's somebody out there that needs to yeah. move, I can. Let's say that both of your spots mm -hmm. in the driveway are full mm -hmm. and somebody else wants to stop and buy lobsters at mm -hmm. the same time. How would you control that? Uh, if somebody's out there and they can't stay, then I would ask them to move, to move along. You know, if I have no problem if somebody can't stay okay. for that time period. Uh, next question regarding the driveway. Um, the way it's set up, there is no turnaround, meaning you, you pull straight in, mm -hmm. unless you're back it in, which I, I noticed that, you know, that, that that can be done, obviously, but mm -hmm. customers don't do that. You know, they're going to pull straight in, which means they've got to back out, which creates a potentially hazardous situation if cars are coming around the corner or something, and, you know, that could create a, a tr safety hazard. It could, but I back out of the driveway every day, and if somebody is responsibly driving, whether it's my driveway or... Bailey's across the street, they would be able to back out appropriately. Would you be willing to put in a turnaround so people could back into the turnaround and then turn around so they're driving out 
straight? If I had the space to do that, but do I, we, I'm sorry. Do you have that space? I, I don't imagine we would have the space to do that. I don't know exactly what, you know, the setbacks, I haven't looked into what that would be, but I can't imagine that that would be a, a feasible option. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> just one, one other you know, question too is, you, since this is a, um, would be a home-based occupation, mm -hmm. right? Normally the applicants will fill out performance standards you know, which is a, it's a separate document that with questions, several questions that relate to very specific questions about what must be done in order to satisfy um, each each of the standards. Is of, that on the website? Because I don't remember seeing that anywhere. When I it, it's it's in the the, the city's uh, um, you know documents. Uh, well, I just I had called to ask exactly what I needed and what I have. The application that I have is okay. what we can still go through that then. Yep. We'll, no, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we will do that. We will ask those questions so you okay. can respond okay. at the appropriate time. So that has to be added on. That's all I had for now. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Stephen. I just have a few questions. Is this going to be year round? I don't know if you said it or. Um, most likely just for the summer into the fall, um, you know, once the, the season shuts down, down in the fall there. Um, I, I honestly don't know exactly what to expect because I'm just starting out, so. Does your um, husband lobster all year? He does, he does lobster I, all I year. don't know. Yeah, yeah, he does lobster. I should know more about it. He, he does. Um, I don't imagine that we would have, it would be worth us to bring lobsters over from Portland, you know, once the end of the season hits. And then um, my other question was, how, how, like, approximately how much time do you think, like, a regular just straight-up uh, transaction would occur? I'm just trying to get an idea of, like, maybe how long somebody would be parked in your driveway. Ten minutes, maybe, 15 at the most. Um, I And I feel like that would be on the high end if you think of going into Harbor Fish and purchasing something. You say, I want, you know, five lobsters, and they bag them up and, and pay, and you're out the door, so... Gotcha. I won't hold you to it. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I also know people can get into conversations and such and that. Yeah, I, I don't... Just to get a rough idea of... Yeah, I don't know. anticipate it, you know, people hanging around for any period of time. That's not going to be... There's not going to be seating. There's not going to be, you know, anything else for them to stay around and do. I think that's all that I have. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Noonan, Mr. Lickman? Nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nothing for me. I just did a couple of calculations to follow up on some of Mr. Burke's concerns, I think, and where he's heading. <clears throat> if for every, let's say you wanted to make $10,000 as supplemental income, <clears throat> then each lobster you sell for 10 bucks ballpark. Maybe it's eight, maybe it's 12, who knows? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, that's 1,000 lobsters. If you're open for 100 days during the summer, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about 10 lobsters per day. Now, if you want to make 20,000, it's 20 lobsters a day and so on, but that's the rough scale of operation. And if each transaction is two or three lobsters, you know, we're talking about maybe a half a dozen, a dozen, maybe as much as 20, perhaps, and that's a pretty good business at that point, <clears throat> a day of additional traffic, people backing in. You know, if we're talking about a 10-minute turnaround time, 15-minute turnaround time, we have 20 of them over the day. Sure, there will maybe one instance, two instances where you've got two or three people wanting to use the facility at the same time. But when you spread it over that time period, it doesn't strike me as being a very significant burden in terms of traffic. That's not to say there won't be an instance in which there are two people waiting. But over the course of a year, I mean, that happens when you have a birthday party, right? I mean, so I, I think just in terms of where I thought the conversation was going, I don't see this being a tremendously difficult burden. But we can get to some further discussion on that later on. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to ask, um, so you're, you're going to have a sign. Is it going to have your phone number? Do people call you before they come, or do they just pull in and ring a bell? And uh, I mean, it could be either one. Um, we obviously don't have anything set up yet, so I would like to do like a 
12, you know, 12 to 5 type situation and just be available for people to come in just as, as they like. Um, or I can, if people wanted to call and set up a time outside of that, that could be a possibility as well. So you anticipate being open for hours 12 to 5, five days a week, seven days a week? Um, probably about four days a week, I would guess, do the weekend. Um, I'm not... Like I said, I'm not 100% sure um, what that's going to look like yet. And it kind of depends on, you know, the amount of people that we have. So you anticipate it'll be four days a week? Likely, yes. Okay. I, too, have a concern about the cars in the driveway. Okay, anyone else? All right, now shall we go through the um, performances standards? Public comments. Are there any public comments? Thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Michaud. I live at 149 Old Blue Point. Um, I'll start by saying the physical install, not an issue. That's, that's not really much different from having an aquarium in your home. That's not my concern. Um, my concern is with the retail storefront use. Um, I've walked this in pretty much the entire neighborhood, and I'm not aware of anyone else with that sort of use, with signage and sales out of their home. Um, the comparisons with Bailey's are flawed because Bailey's existed before the zone was created and has an as-use exemption, or I'm not sure what, the, what that's called, but um, that's probably also true of Turner's and Ken's. Um, I believe they were in the zone before the zone was created. Um, but the zones exist to separate business use, retail, commercial, industrial, from residential use. Um, and this is a situation where you'd be adding retail to a residential zone. Um, as such, it would create precedent for anyone else who wanted to do something similar anywhere else in the zone, and in any residential zone, to be honest. Um, so. That's my main concern is what this would do to the zoning overall. Um, also, there's really no limits and in attached to this. Um, it's purportedly a few lobsters a day. I don't think I would notice that, but there's no limits here. Um, and Scarborough has retail zones where sales of items are permitted. Um, as I said, I've walked pretty much the entire neighborhood. The only businesses I've seen are the ones that, like Bailey's, had a pre-existing condition. So um, I'm concerned about the carry-on effects from this, the precedent it would set. Um, I'm concerned that there's no, there's no limits. Um, there's very few specifics on signage and hours. Um, and but uh, you received my statement about the road and concerns about when the parking spaces are inadequate. Um, that would, again, tie in with the amount of business uh, that's included. So, But I wanted to clear up, especially the comparison with Bailey's. Um, their existence in the zone predates the zone. It does not create pre precedent for retail use of the zone. And as far as I can see, no retail use has been permitted um, in the past 40 or 50 years that the zone has been around. So um, maybe there are some other business uses that are in the home that aren't retail storefronts, but that's effectively what this becomes. So that's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michelle. We are in receipt of your letter. We all have a copy. Madam Chair? Yes. Can I ask Mr. Michelle a question? Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Michaud, have you read the town ordinance regarding uh, home businesses permitted in retail 
zones? Uh, no, because this is not a retail zone. This is, excuse me, but uh, home businesses are permitted in, re in, in residential. residential zones. Oh, Pardon residential me. zones. Yeah, in, I misspoke, thank you. In residential zones. Uh, yes, but is retail permitted? Yes, well, retail is part of it, okay? But okay. it has to be self-contained within the residence or, like in this case, a garage, all right? So there's no storefront. There is signage associated. Yes, and that's permitted also. Okay. All right, so I just want to clarify that what, the, what you, you said up to this point is all permitted within the town's ordinance. Okay, so I could establish a, a business in my own garage yes. without these limits? And yes, you would have to come before you'd us. You'd have and, to come before and, us. Yeah. And satisfy all the criteria. Can I ask how many times that such a waiver has been granted in this zone? We do it all the time. And I can I add that we don't actually make decisions with precedence. We yeah. do them by case by case. So just because this gets granted or not granted does not have any impact on future decisions. Mm. And it, it becomes part of the public record though. It does become part of the public record. And can be referred to as justification. It can't. It's, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Take shouldn't, any, but. Well, as the board here, we are not supposed to take any extra information like other cases and use that as knowledge to make a decision on our the case that we're hearing before us is my understanding. I don't know if someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I did want to point that out. Okay. Mr. Bork. Yes, one more, uh, uh, I guess, a question to, for Mr. Michaud. Uh, Mr. Michaud, in your written testimony, you did express a concern about uh, parking, traffic, yes. uh, you know, the impact that this might have on this particular street. I would be very interested in learning more about your concern in that regard, because that is definitely one of the criteria that we need to consider. Okay, yeah, the the... That aspect, um, again, it's not my primary concern. My primary concern is really the limits on how much retail can be done at the location. Um, and there's nothing in there. But regarding the parking, um, the photos in the, that I sent clearly show what happens when street parking occurs, it blocks the roadway. Sidewalk parking occurs, it blocks the sidewalk. Um, not shown is that this property is on a corner and there's a blind driveway, mine driveway, <laughs> which I have to back up very carefully. Um, and it's not quite as bad at 147. I, I would say the visibility is significantly better there. Um, but if you added the complication of street parking right on that corner, um, it's not just a hazard for me, it's also a hazard for people coming around the corner who can't see um, that someone is going around a car parked in the street. So um, that's definitely still a major concern. Thank you very much. Yep. Madam Chair, can I ask a quick question as well? Certainly. M M Mr. Michaud, is there currently signage on Old Blue Point Road about parking? Is there any kind of sign like, no parking? None that I'm aware of, no, no. Although the striping <laughs> makes it clear when you're parked in the road, you're blocking the roadway. And if you're parked on the sidewalk, it's obvious you're blocking the sidewalk. Um, but as was said, there are people who do that. They're on a straightaway, which is, I guess, less hazardous, but it's still an inconvenience for, or more than an inconvenience for pedestrians or people with strollers and stuff. So, yeah. Sorry. And Can I ask thank you? you for clarifying. I was not aware that retail use was allowed in R2 zones. So. Can I ask with you? With a special yeah, exception sure. permit. <laughs> Keep leaving with it to a special exception permit. With a special exception. Well, I, most things are possible with a special exception, I think. You had stated that um, the not having limits to certain aspects of the application and the business Mostly were volume. concerning. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see if we were to put limits on something? I'm not, and I'm not saying that we will. I just, just to get your opinion on that. Uh, can I even do that? 
Well, it's an opinion. I can give an opinion, and you can do. You're you're the ones in charge. All I can offer is an opinion. Uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, um, what what I should say really is that I would like my neighbor's business to be successful. I would like them to have a successful business. It's just that this location, if it's successful, um, would reach a level that would be significantly impactful to the neighborhood, mainly in the traffic, the throughput in and out. So um, what level? I mean, any level that would exceed the available parking, certainly. Um, so more than, any more than two concurrent customers is, is a major problem because preventing people from, or preventing people from parking in the street when there's no spaces available is kind of impossible if people want to, the customers are going to do what they want. So, um, so that's one criteria. In terms of total volume, I mean, that's partly depending on the hours of operation, which are undefined at this point. Um, so that's a, another consideration. We don't hear a ton of special exception permits, so that was... Okay. Um, I was going to say, I haven't seen, <laughs> so there can't be many. Uh, maybe it's a process that's been used frequently around the town, but um, I... We hear them my wife and I time. walk all over the neighborhood. I don't know that we've had public comment on it, so um, thank you very yeah. much. Just Any other questions? No, it's not a question. <laughs> I just want to point out uh, that at our last meeting of four appeals, two of them were special exceptions. For retail? Uh, they're, they're all different. Okay. They're all different. Some retail hmm. I was specific to retail, just for the record. All based off of what? Sorry. All based off. Excuse me. Microphone will shut off. Uh, it's a home-based occupation business. Yeah. Okay. But there's there's all different, different types of home-based yeah, occupations. Service, ones service that draw related. new. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could be a it's a wide range of yeah. different types that we hear. My concern is with those that draw traffic to the neighborhood. Okay. And, your yeah. concerns That's our concern are and require signage too. So your concerns are duly noted. Thank you. And we're <laughs> going to further discuss this item. Any other questions? You may sit down, Mr. Misha. Um, we're going to go over the standards for special exceptions. And um, I guess we'll just start with A. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Uh, I'm happy to jump in. I think this criteria is satisfied as, as even the um, a butter who opposes the application acknowledged is basically like a home aquarium. So I don't see that this is um, any unsanitary or unhealthful conditions would result from um, approving this application. Thank you. Anyone else? Madam Chair, I think the applicant wanted to ask you a question. Um, we may need, will we need her for any of these, Brian? Well, yeah, you haven't. Uh... You'll need her to address the performance standards that Mr. Bork raised later, uh, earlier. Okay. Um. Oh, I should mention too. You know, the applicant has should be given the opportunity to rebut any comments from from the public as well. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to start here. I was on the wrong page. The performance. Standard. I meant to start there. Okay, should, should I have the application at this point? If she's got a question, I'll Okay. Come on up, Ms. Holmes. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the extra time. Um, I just wanted to say, in reference to parking, um, if placing signage, no parking, you know, on the sidewalk, put cones out there with a string along the sidewalk, you know, with it in the sidewalk that says no parking, um, so we could prevent people from parking on the sidewalk. I don't think that that would be something that would be out of the realm of a possibility. And in reference to the house where people do park on the sidewalk, it's uh, four, four or so houses down. They've got about eight cars. Um, they've got a bunch of teenagers that live in the house. And so that's, they've got friends coming and going. So a lot of the cars that are parking there, it's 
17 and 18 year old kids who are not following the rules um, because they're popping into their friend's house and popping out. Um, so just for some context, it's a big house, big family. Um, and it is typically, I feel the teenagers, you know, coming and going um, that if it is blocked down the road, that's the scenario that it typically is. So that is all, thank you. Madam Chair, I have a follow up question to Brian regarding uh, that issue about sidewalks, cones placed on sidewalks and possibly cones placed in the road. Would any of that be approved by the town? I think, I think if, you, if, if someone was operating a home-based business and parking along the road would be detrimental and dangerous, they would certainly have the right to put homemade, uh, perhaps sandwich board type signs out saying no customer parking and place them strategically in those locations along, I would put not in the road necessarily, but on the curb line, partly, maybe partly in the road and on, how on close, the curb. How close is the road to the sidewalk? Is there any space in between? I don't even know that there's a, is there a sidewalk looks there? looks like there. There's, there's, yeah. there's a sidewalk. I mean, there's a normal shoulder from yeah. the road so, to I mean, the sidewalk. You could, you, could place, you could place a sign so that it was it was visible. It could also hey, be no customer parking. It could also be within the yard too. It doesn't have to be on the sidewalk. We could place it in the yard. Right. That, that's that was my concern. It, yeah. it, it might be more appropriate to place it on the just right next to the sidewalk mm -hmm. on your lawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, something is effective. Yep. No parking on the sidewalk or the road. Yep. You know, Absolutely. Just, just during business hours. During business hours, you know, yeah. And, and you know, Brian can help you with that particular thing. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm, that I was just going to suggest that that's one way that you could at, at least attempt to control that that issue. Right. I'm not saying that that makes it go away. It's 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 an attempt to control that issue. Thank you. You want to go? Do you want to go over the performance? Standards yes. While she's there? Yes. All right, please stay with us while we go over the performance standards for home occupations. Number one, the occupation or profession will be carried on wholly within the principal building or within a building accessory there too. Yeah. Yes, it will be within the garage. The home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. Yes. No more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling unit shall be employed in the home occupation. Correct. Number four, exterior signage shall be permitted in accordance with the home occupation sign provisions under section 12, sign regulation subsection E. And you've talked with Mr. Longstaff about that? Uh, we spoke briefly about it um, before, and I know that there is another ordinance that the signage must comply with, so I'm aware you're of You're aware of it, and you're yeah. willing to do that. Yes, ma'am. Number five, there shall be no exterior display, no exterior storage of materials, and no other exterior indication of the home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal building except as expressly permitted by the district regulations of this ordinance. This prohibition shall not apply to the storage of lobster traps. Yes, ma'am. Number six, no nuisance shall be generated, including but not necessarily limited to offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, heat, or glare. No, ma'am. Number seven, the traffic generated by such home occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create a traffic hazard or disturb the residential char character of the immediate neighborhood. I don't believe that it will. Um, I know that has been spoken on the contrary. However, the traffic that goes to Peterson Ballfield, that is, you know, it's, they have little league games down there. There's lots of families in and out. I don't believe that this would create anything in excess of the traffic that is already there. I realize it will be bringing more people to my house. I understand that. That was something that we thought about a lot before we decided that this was going to be a possibility, but I don't think that it will impact the community negatively. 
Eight, in addition to the off-street parking provided to meet the normal requirements of the dwelling, adequate off-street parking shall be provided for the vehicles of each employee and the vehicles of the maximum number of users or customers the home occupation may attract during peak operating hours. I believe that it will be fine. I know I put in the application, there's two designated spots. There will technically be three with my car parked in the garage in the other side of the bay. So there, you know, somebody might have to wait for another customer to leave if they are pulled in behind them. But with three parking spots, I don't anticipate that we're gonna have more customers than that at any given time. Nine, the home occupation may utilize a, not more than 20% of the dwelling unit floor area, provided that for the purposes of this calculation, unfinished basement and attic spaces are not included, b, unfinished attic and basement spaces, and c, space within an accessory building totaling not more than 1,000 square feet of floor area. Yes, ma'am. 10. Home occupations may include retail sales subject to the following limitations. The total area devoted to retail sales is limited to 400 square feet and must be fully enclosed within a building. B, the sale of products is limited to products and articles produced, assembled, or processed on the premises and seafood caught or harvested off the premises by persons who reside in the dwelling unit or by the one employee permitted under paragraph three above. Yes, ma'am. 11. Madam Chair, may I ask you just a question on that? Yes, you may. All right, so what, what that says is it has to be fully enclosed. And if, if I'm interpreting this correctly, which I may not be doing, to me that means there needs to be a wall separating the, gar the garage so that you have this side of the garage as your retail space, and then you have the other side for personal use space. Am I misinterpreting that, Mr. Longstaff? I think it's, it's open to interpretation, but what it's trying to say is you can't be selling outside. You can't, you can't have your, your selling stuff out in the yard. Well, I, that's my interpretation. I think if, if she's designating half of the garage, which I believe she said was some 280 something square feet, right. then she's met the 20% and she's also met the 400, less than 400 square yeah, feet of retail. So it does not have, need, necessarily need to have a- It's all undercover. So I look at it it's as It's all being, yeah. closed, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, no differently than if you were selling baked goods out of your kitchen. You, you can't, you're not going to create walls to create a, a 400 square foot True, but retail. Within space. a home, there are walls. Within Separate a garage, walls. there's walls as well. Um, some <coughs> garages do have interior walls. I haven't seen many. But, but my point is, Dave, my point is if you have an open kitchen and you, you're making baked goods there in your kitchen, there's not, you're not partitioning off another section of your kitchen to do your retail sales out of. So I think, I think again, the point is. No outside sales, which really would disturb neighbors as far as having activity going on outside of walls. It's all enclosed inside. Can I think that's that's the way I interpret it. Madam and, Chair. And as long as they've designated that area, I think that's fine. That That's my interpretation. Thank you. Madam Chair, do you mind reading that criteria? I think it was number 11 again. I, I didn't get to 11. Or whatever. I'm sorry. Maybe it was 10. 10. Home occupations may include retail sales subject to the following limitations. The total area devoted to retail sales is limited to 400 square feet and must be enclosed within a building. Okay, so I think, the, I think what this is saying is no yard sales. That's my reading. Nothing of outside in the yard, yes. Thank you. Shall I move on? Number 11, a fisherman, lobsterman, or shellfish harvester need not obtain home occupation approval except to engage in retail sales allowed under paragraph 9B above. And 12, motor vehicle repairs and motor vehicle towing businesses are not allowed as home occupations. All right, and those are the... Um, 
performance standards. Anyone have any more questions or comments for the petitioner? Madam Chair, I would suggest if it be your pleasure that you do an up and down vote on those performance standards being met or not met. And if anyone feels that any one of those performance standards weren't met, they can uh, add that to the, to the uh, motion. Okay. Hmm. Does anyone have any concerns about any of the criteria not being met? Mr. Bork. Yes, adequate parking for the business. The uh, applicant has not provided us with any kind of a business plan showing uh, how many customers to expect during peak hours. It's just a speculation. I think any business, including home businesses, need to have business plans. They need to have an idea of how many customers they need to serve uh, in order to produce a reasonable profit. Uh, we have a, a tank, a lobster tank in there, which is rather large. It's 12 feet by 4 feet by 4 feet. That can hold a lot of lobsters, probably several hundred lobsters. In fact, you know, I think I look at the lobster tank at Hannaford, for example, which is relatively small, and they seem to cram probably close to about 50 or 60 lobsters in there. So I can imagine a tank this big can hold many hundreds. So it has the capability of, of doing a lot of business, and I think that's good. But if, if you really want to start a business and be successful, you have to have a plan and you have to provide all the criteria in order to be able to satisfy the needs of the business. And parking is a critical issue here. Not only do you lack enough parking spaces, but there's not a turnaround, meaning a place for, for people can, can back into and then do a, a 180. So they're driving out of the driveway head first instead of backing out, that's, which is highly unsafe. Uh, and as been noted, it is a curved road there, so the visibility is somewhat impaired. So I have a concern about that particular criterion. Madam Chair, may I chime Yes, you in? may, Mr. Noonan. I, I'm gonna take, with, with no disrespect to Mr. Bork, a somewhat different approach. I am not troubled by the parking issue. I've been a, I, I stop into Turner's from time to time, which is on a much busier road. Um, I think has much higher visibility for their lobster sign than this business will have. I've never been, I've never had more than one other customer be there on a weekend afternoon. I, I and just, I don't think it's very likely that there's going to be more than a trickle of customers into this business. And I also think just given the nature of the road, a, a customer that sees that there is no parking available on the street is not going, excuse me, in the driveway is not going to just park on the street and chance it. And to the extent that that might happen or that th we're concerned that there is a risk that a customer might do that. I think we could address that with a condition for this application that there be a sign saying, um, you know, signs on either side of the driveway, or some, some sort of signage to be put out by the applicant when the business is open stating no parking on the street, no parking on the sidewalk. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? I'm, I have some familiarity with a business like this, and um, I'm inclined to agree with Mr. Noonan, but I think my concern is more about the amorphous application, the hours, the days, the, um, you know, how, I, I guess that's, kind of where my concern is coming from. A apart, from, I do agree with Mr. Bork, though. There's a concern about traffic. But I think Mr. Noonan stated pretty well that this kind of business doesn't generate a lot of activity. Um, I, I if you could put a turnaround in your yard, a way for a person to back mm -hmm. into your lawn and then drive out forward, that would be better. But um, 
I do think, as Mr. Noonan said, there's other ways to address the traffic. But I'm also concerned about sort of when you're going to be doing this, when you're inviting people to your property. Well, and if we need to set, I wasn't aware that I would need to present exact hours to the board tonight. So, I mean, if you want me to say 11 to 5, 11 to 6, 12 to 5, whatever that looks like, we can discuss that. And I'm open to saying these are what the hours will be. I just hadn't set that in stone yet. Um, I've just been a, a week and a half not working and working on getting the garage cleared out and set up. So um, that's really what it comes down to is that, you know, I can commit to if you guys want that, you know, that if, you, if the hour, if having the hours of operation make or break the determination, we can decide that. Uh, Madam Chair, um, for the applicant's um, information, I mean, it, it was one of the criteria of the special exceptions, right? It was right there. Won't won't generate what it, it actually reads. I'll read it. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. So, I mean, it is a criteria. So some thought should have. Well, no, I, it, those general hours, I'm just saying, is it the difference? Is it noon or one o'clock? That's the, it's not going to be 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., Right. you know. Well, I don't think the board is interested in locking you down to a specific mm -hmm. 12, but I think they, they do want to know. I mean, you said, we're thinking four days a week. Well, is it going to be four or is it going to be six? Or I mean, you should have some well, basic I, thought put into I, ha I have when are we going to I have put operate? some basic thought into it but yeah. I didn't realize that that was But again yeah. it's a criteria I, so you need to come up with some some firmer numbers at least you know I mean if I say 5 days a week from 11 to 6 to encompass what we may be open and it will be up to that Well I mean can before you do that <laughs> consider that your answer may impact the board's decision. So, I mean, it shouldn't be just willing. If you go too broad, maybe that's going to be a no for you. I, I, I don't, I, I'm trying, I guess what I'm trying to do is, is, is sort of impart upon you the importance of having, as Mr. Bork had stated, some kind of a plan for how you're going to operate the business. Right. I, I understand that. Sure. The answer that she gave to item I is exact hours are to be determined, but will be during daylight hours and less than businesses in the surrounding area. <clears throat> I think that's a reasonable and way of describing how a business begins to operate. I mean, the idea that we're going to have, you know, like a Harvard business plan developed for a business that's operating out of a home seems to be a level of requirement we're imposing on somebody that we would never require, or we've never required in the past on people who sell jelly out of their houses or people that want to do massage therapy out of their houses in the past. I mean, I think what she's given us is on, on the paper, it conforms with the criteria and I that we have to review and make sure that it meets it. If people don't think it meets it, they can vote against it. But I think she has providing us with what her business plan is. So, and yeah. I, Along those lines, I don't see item I as trying to pin down the applicant as to specific hours that they're working. So let's say that that she and Mr. Libby had proposed to sell bait and people would be only getting in there to buy bait between 5 and 8 a.m. That would be the kind, by its nature, the business would create traffic at a time that would be inappropriate or inconsistent with its residential nature. So that's, I think, what, what criteria I is sort of getting at. I think that the retail, um, the sort of daytime or sort of normal business hours retail proposal that we have here is, um, I think what, what, what has been provided to us is basically an expression of we're going to run this during the day, during normal business hours. Um, and I think that's all that criteria I is really sort of getting at is just, um, is this the kind of thing that is consistent with a residential neighborhood? And I would also like to say, it's not that I haven't put any thought into it. I have a new baby and I just came off from my other job. And so I've put lots of thought into it. I just don't know what that's going to look like. My daughter's going to be home with me. So 
I might say 11 to 5 is what we're going to be open, and that might, you know, two weeks from now or a month from now or however long, that might not might not work because I have a five-month-old or a six-month-old, you know. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, and that's why it's so general. It's not that I haven't put thought into it. I could have wrote it down the exact hours and say, this is what we're going to do, but I have my daughter who I have to work around. <laughs> so that's that's where the, the looseness comes from. It's not because I don't have an idea of what I'm doing. And the days of the week, is there any concerns about... Seven days a week, five days a week, days of the week. Madam Chair, uh, I, I, I'm still concerned about the lack of parking and what could happen during peak times. Uh, yes, there may be occasional, but there are a lot of businesses that, you know, when you average things out, the averages hide a lot of what's really going on from moment to moment. And this very limited amount of, of parking space there concerns me. If you're relying on people to just pull up in order to make a sale, that, that's random, okay? So I guess the question I would have, and maybe this could be a condition, would you be willing to set the business up so that it's uh, by special appointment, meaning people would, you know, through a website or social media, whatever, where people could make appointments to come out at specific times to make purchases? Is that something that you would be willing to do? I would be willing to do it. I'm, I would hope that I wouldn't have to, but if that is, again, you know, a condition that you guys would put in place, then I would be open to that, yes. With that kind of a condition, I'd be willing to yield on the trap or the parking issue because that would definitely limit how many cars would be in the driveway at any given time. In fact, you could have it set up so there's only one car going there. And regarding the hours of operation, daylight varies quite a bit depending on the time of the year. During the, slow, uh, you know, the, the, the time of the, of the winter months, okay, you know, the, the, the shortest day of the year, it gets dark before 4 o'clock. During the longest days of the year, like we're about to come to now in June, uh, it's light out there until 9, 9.30. And... Um, so the definition of daylight hours flexes so much. At the same time, daylight hours is important in terms of safety. I assume there are no traffic lights, or no, excuse me, there are no um, uh, street, street lights on the street, is that true? Uh, to like illuminate the light? Yeah, or to, to illuminate yeah, but, the road, yeah. Yeah, there are. Oh, there are, okay. Yeah. All right, so, all right, well that helps, okay, because it is a narrow road, but still with the visibility issue, during the daytime, visibility is much easier than at nighttime. So if, if you could limit it to daylight only, okay, which, again, realizing that flexes a lot mm -hmm. throughout the year, I'd be okay with that. And also, where it could be by appointment only. Would, if it was dark, by appointment? I, I think, no. Uh, there's a hazard at nighttime, is what I'm saying. Right, I understand yeah. that, but I, I just meant like the random versus the appointment. Because if it's one car that has an appointment after the sun goes down, is that still, you know, r raised to the level of hazard in your opinion? It might. Yeah, I, I think you're much better off trying to operate during daylight hours. And again, that changes throughout the course of the year in terms of safety now, and that's, to me, that's the issue now. It's a narrow, curved road, very limited number of parking spaces, and without a plan for your driveway, and you're saying it may not be possible to have a turn around uh, so that people can exit facing the road instead of backing into it, uh, I, that's my big concern right there. But if you could, you know, change, if you could develop a business plan and when I say business plan, I'm not talking about a Harvard business plan here, with all due respect to the other members of the board. I'm talking about a fundamental, basic business plan that any small business should have, okay? You know, it includes our hours of operation, how the business is going to run. And marketing the business is so important because uh, right now, more and more business is done on social media and on web sites. So ordering that way is actually very simple. Um, and if you'd be willing to set it up that way, I would feel a lot more comfortable. 
Now, I don't want to put too many conditions on this for you. Yeah, I, I'm just simply ex expressing my concern. No, I understand. I mean, if setting it up by appointment only is, again, you know, what makes or breaks it, then I'm going to be willing to do whatever whatever the board requires. Um, again, I would hope that that wouldn't be the case because if somebody is driving by and they want to stop, I wouldn't want to, sorry, you can't come in without an appointment. What does that look like, you know? Yeah, right, and, Madam Chair. and you, I understand your point and, and <clears throat> perhaps, the, you, so if you're, let me put it this way. What if your primary way of marketing the business is through appointments, understanding you might have some walk-ins. Now, Blue Point, all Blue Point Road, right? It's not a major road, is it? No. Is it, it's a secondary road? Okay. So how much traffic are you going to have? How, much, how many people are going by? They're going to say, oh, let's go buy lobsters. Very few. Madam Chair, I think we're getting off the okay. point. I, I mean, we're, we're, Bork, gonna, we're trying to run her business now, and, and that's not our job. She's presented us an application. <clears throat> she's answered the questions as she believes she's going to operate the business. I think it's time to sort of go through, the, go through them, decide whether or not we support the business that she has proposed, not the business that we'd like her to create. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. So, however, I do want to note that in I, you do say, but your business will be during daylight hours. You did put that in. So now we're going to go through each of these points. How about performance standards, Madam Chair? We did that. Oh. Do I have a motion? For a vote on the performance standards. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Opposed? Mr. Bork? Four in favor, one opposed. All right. Now we'll go over the standards. We go back to this and we vote on each one. Yes. Thank you. Okay, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects, aspects of its design or operation. Any comment? <clears throat> All in favor? Okay, five zero. The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. So moved. Mr. Oh, thank you. Second. You're not taking the motion. You're just oh. doing it. This is just a criteria. We're just, we're just, voting. We're just voting. Okay. We're just voting. All, yeah. those, All right. All in favor? Well, before we, we jump into that, this has, been, this has been the controversial issue with the board to date. And so <clears throat> it, it seems to me that what we have is a small business looking at the kind of volume <clears throat> that we're going to be likely to be looking at, given that there's two and potentially three parking places, and given that there's an opportunity to put a sign out that says, please do not park on the street or on the sidewalk, that the volume of traffic coming into this business won't be such as to create any traffic conditions that would be unsafe to the general public. So I think <clears throat> that the applicant has demonstrated by the, by the business that she has presented to us that this criteria will be met. Thank you. I would like to add that this particular um, uh, exception on this side is saying for the foreseeable traffic so you're only going off what you can you know you don't anticipate there being any 100 person uh, unit building being built and you know more traffic coming in this is a residential road I would recommend, again, we're not here to tell you how to run your business, but making that safe for people to go in and out because it is very concerning. However, I think you have also met that criteria. Thank you. All in? Any more discussion? Any more discussion? All in favor? No. Oh, you're not done. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't have my mic on. 
Uh, I just want to reiterate my opposition to this standard being met. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Four. Opposed? One. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Discussion? All in favor? Five zero. Thank you. D, the proposed. Chair. Yes. Before you go, before you rush to the vote, it would be good to get some comment because we are trying to do findings oh, of fact. We need, comment. we need findings of fact Thank and you. conclusions. So let's not rush to the vote. Let's see if we can come up with some findings in order to support the vote. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So in public safety, can someone um, propose some findings of fact? Madam Chair, given the location of the home operation on Old Blue Point Road, the fact that there are restaurants nearby, the fact that there's a field, baseball field, I mean, there are a lot of activities going on. This will not create any incremental level of activity that will be perceptible. <clears throat> the home business is not going to impose any additional obligations on the fire department. It's a self-contained tank. It's not going to explode. There are no flammable materials involved in it. We don't expect any police, additional police protection. The level of activity that's going on here is fairly typical to what would happen in a normal home under normal circumstances. So I think the criteria has been met. Thank you. Mr. Bork. Yes, I agree. And um, again, we're only talking here about police and fire. And uh, I don't think there's any possibility of fire due to this kind of a business. Um, Police, there should not be unless there's an accident, but uh, you know, hopefully there are never any accidents. All right, discussion over. All in favor? Five zero. The proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. The I'll go out on a limb and take this one. <laughs> go ahead. Um, there's the application has no increase in impervious surface or um, other changes to the ground covering of the lot. So I think that this criteria is satisfied. Thank you, Mr. Noonan. Any more discussion? All in favor? Five zero. E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Any comments? <clears throat> Mr. Leitman? The only issue here, really, in terms of the physical size, visual impact, proximity, and so on, we're using the existing building, so that will have no impacts on any of those criteria, with the possible exception of signage, and the applicant has indicated that she would comply with this, the town's requirements with, with respect to signage. Intensity of use, <clears throat> the property will obviously be used a little bit more intensively than it otherwise would have been used, but again, I think that Given the level of volume that we're talking about here, it's not out of the ordinary with what might be expected to occur in, in homes. Certainly, it's going to be less intensively used than the one down the street where the teenagers are coming in at all times during the day. So I don't think it's going to create any kind of a problem with respect to these criteria for the neighborhood. In less than 10 years. In 10 years, she's going to have a teenager, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the only... Uh, what I would like to comment on is intensity of use as, as it applies to the neighborhood. I'm not sure how to define neighborhood, if it's the entire residential zone or just Old Blue Point Road, because it's two entirely different things. So it's not Pine Point Road, you know, where all the other businesses are located, which are truly commercial businesses. This is a home use business. Um, I, you know, that said, I think the intensity of use here is not going to be sufficiently greater than anything else that's going on in that neighborhood, you know, including old, just old 
Blue Point Road. So I don't think that's an issue really. It's, it's minor. Thank you. More discussion? All in favor? Five zero. You think we won't have questions? Okay. Well, All right. You're, you're done with that. You're All right. The findings. Thank All you. right. If you'd like to sit down, you may, Ms. Holmes. Thank you. F. If located in a shoreland zone as depicted on the Town of Scarborough official shoreland zoning map, the proposed use will comply with all the requirements of the Town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance. Mr. Longstaff. Um, yes, Madam Chair, I can verify that the uh, location is not in shoreland zone or in a special flood hazard area. Thank you. All in favor? Five zero. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. <clears throat> the applicant has demonstrated through provision of the <clears throat> property tax bill that they have ownership of the property. So I think that criteria is met. Thank you. Any more discussion? All in favor? Five zero. The applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection five of this section. I would have liked to see something a little bit more than a yes. Um, we didn't really discuss this too much, but um, you know, her husband's employed, so the financial ability, uh, I'm assuming, and she was employed, um, has been met and um, technical, and she was in some sort of corporate job, so I assume she has technical skills to, you know, work around anything that we uh, would impose on her. So. But I would have liked to see a little bit more than a yes. Madam Chair, can yes. I chime in on this? Yes. I, I actually think that as to this application, the standards don't really impose any technical or financial requirements that are meaningful because there, there aren't really any changes, material changes to the property that are, that are occurring here. Um, and we haven't imp imposed any conditions. So I think that, that, this, um, that subsection H has been met. Okay, thank you, Mr. Noonan. All right, shall we take a vote? All in favor? Five zero. Aye. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. Any comments? <clears throat> I would like to make one on this one that's a little bit <clears throat> off the point a bit. There was some discussion earlier in the meeting about precedent setting. And <clears throat> the only time in which the standards reference existing uses in the neighborhood is in this criteria. So it is possible for somebody in the public to look at this and say, if we allow one in, then that's an existing use in the neighborhood and therefore we'll have to allow others in. But I think it's important to note that it's existing uses in the neighborhood that's qualified. It's not with respect to home businesses. It's with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. And so I don't think that by granting in this neighborhood or any neighborhood in Scarborough the opportunity to, to have a home business creates any kind of precedent with respect to the existing use under this standard. So with that as preface, what I'd like to say is that <clears throat> with respect to the generation of noise, um, there will be none that's other than what you normally would have in this neighborhood. Traffic is gonna be de minimis um, relative to the use of this road. And with respect to hours of operation, the applicant has indicated that the hours would be during daylight hours. And I don't think we have to impose a condition in that respect. I think it's, in the, it's part of the application. So I think the applicant has met the standard. Thank you. 
Any other comment? All in favor? Five zero. At this point, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the <clears throat> variance appeal. Thank you. Do so, I have a second? Mr. Borg seconds it. Any other comments on this petition? All right. Seeing none, all in favor? Four. Opposed? One. Thank you, Mr. Borg, and thank you, fellow board members. Your petition passes. Pop up here. I didn't know if you were finished talking. I do want to thank everybody very much for your time. I appreciate and walking me through everything. So I do appreciate it very much. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. Any other business we need to take up or discussion? Anyone have any more comments? Mr. Bork? Yeah, just a question. Uh, were any of the members of the board uh, able to attend the uh, uh, main municipal association uh, session for planning boards and CBAs I, I, last week? Yeah. Oh, good, good, yeah. good for yeah. you. Yeah, it was All great. Right. It was a, a good opportunity. I was surprised how many participants, uh, attendees there were. There were 50 or 60 <laughs> people there. And uh, it was nice to see, um, I mean, I, I can't say I met anybody sitting at my table that was also sitting on the Board of Appeals. They were all uh, COs or, or um, on planning, planning boards. Planning boards at, but um, yeah, I thought so it was- So it was in person? It was in person, which, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a ride to do this thing, but very much worth it. Um, in fact, I think probably the most enlightening part of it wasn't necessarily the presentation material, but the questions, <clears throat> which everybody sort of skirted around asking hypothetical questions that were unrelated to anything that they were dealing with uh, or dealing with the boards. But, uh, but it was really interesting to listen to the attorneys design for sort of answer. You know, um, I think questions that we probably all deal with, you deal with, I'm just starting, but you know, around, well, how do you, how do you, you know. Oh, I was just going to say, that's why it's nice to have Brian too, because he's right. so well versed, right. you know, having and, staff yeah. to help us out and say, you know, you can't do that, or you can do that, or can, you right. should do this, or not do this. Right. Or I mean, you exactly don't, black you know and what white, I mean? Right. A little, yeah. So anyway, it was a great, great session. You know, if anybody has not attended, I would strongly encourage you to do so. I've attended several times in the past. I did the years. Zoom uh, one. Uh, and one thing I'd like to point out regarding the, that training, and, and this really has to do with state law. Um, state uh, controls basically one type of appeal uh, statewide, okay? And that's the undue hardship appeal, if I'm not mistaken, Brian. Is that the only one that's statewide? So the majority of the discussion at these sessions is regarding undue exception. And if you think that that's the only kind of appeals we hear, it's not. Because we hear others like practical difficulty tonight, which is a much lower bar. Miscellaneous appeals, we get them all the time. Home occupation, a whole range of different things. We have administrative appeals. We had one recently. And Brian was the uh, person being challenged, and we unanimously <laughs> backed Brian on that one. Thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah, I thought we just kind of rubbed it in there. Twice in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's, um, there's, a, there's a lot more that we do. Uh, shoreland zoning, that's something new to us. Uh, that was uh, delegated to us by the uh, planning board. Uh, so there's a whole range of different things that we do in Scarborough that other municipalities don't do. You know, and that's that's important to understand. So if you go to one of those meetings, you're going to think that, okay, that's it. No, it's not. It's a lot more. Uh, from time to time, we do have our town attorney, uh, Phil Saucier, uh, do presentations. 
and we get more into the detail of what we do in Scarborough, you know, all the other types of, um, you know, zoning appeals that come before us and administrative appeals occasionally, not, not too often. But, uh, so, yeah, I certainly urge you to keep going with those. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I just wanted to note that in our packet we had a nice <clears throat> presentation of our batting average last year, and I want to thank whoever put this together. I'm sure Maureen for putting it together. It's nice to see how much work that we go into this. The other thing that was in our packet was this remote participation policy, <clears throat> and I know I've been away for a while, and I know there were some issues around remote participation. Was this in here because we wanted to discuss it, or re review it, or is it something we should do at our next meeting and plan on discussing it then? What was the purpose? I think we've always had that in there. And um, we had discussed it maybe before you came on, and it's kind of just in there as a reminder, if I'm not mistaken. Well, actually, I think somebody raised the issue of the remote participation policy back in May when we did not have a meeting because right. someone was going to be oh, out of there. town. Right. And then, and then, of course, again tonight, Peter was out of town. So I think it was brought up to discuss it, and and I would only my only comment on it, you certainly have the ability to change your policy at at any point, and not to sound like a I'm not scolding the board or anything, but I did remind the board several times when you created the policy, you are the only board in town that has a policy like yours. Everybody else did the hybrid meeting thing, so yeah. you could you could constantly have me, people participate either in person or <clears throat> remotely. You know, I'm not again not suggesting that you do that. I was, I'm just reminding you that you are the only board that has the in person policy only, and that's your choice. You can change it, um, but my only my only caution is. You have to change it within the rules um, that, that the legislature created for that. And I would probably want to make sure that whatever you drafted for a change, we run by the town attorney for to make sure that we're in good standing in changing it. So that's, Brian, that's why it's in there. Could you, <clears throat> could you or somebody send around to us the policies that some of the other committees might have that allow remote participation? We can take a look at them. Yeah, sure. I wouldn't be opposed to changing it. I sure, think I can do that. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, I can remember uh, several instances in the past, throughout the pandemic, uh, where we're doing hybrids and cases where it had to be remote, all remote, and we had technical glitches. Uh, we had a lot of issues come up. I'm not pointing any fingers on why. Okay, but they haven't. Um, and I think part of the reason that we established this policy was it's going to be either or. You know, we're going to either do it all in person, everybody's got to be here, or all remote. You can't, you know, we, we really didn't want to get into the hybrid at all. So that's, that's the reason we wrote this policy the way it is. Yeah, we could change it, but I just simply want to caution, you know, some of the, the newer members. You know, these decisions have unintended consequences. You just never know what can go wrong when you're relying on, you know, digital things, electronics, whatever, uh, to make things work because I've seen it break so many times. Yeah, well, uh, and, and Mr. Bork's right. We did have, we were early adopters of, of the technology and it was still going through its infancy stage as far as our use of it and there were technical difficulties. However, we now have a dedicated and trained staff and all the other board, I'll remind you one more time, Dave, all the other boards are using it. <laughs> I, like be, I like being unique. This, this was a, a, a point of discussion in the training session. And um, in the context of, you know, some boards in, in some of the smaller towns, you know, they, they don't get together very often. Uh, it's not maybe once a year or twice a year they have an appeal come through. The discussion basically centered around the open meetings requirements at the state level and making sure that whatever technology you use. Joe, you got to make sure you use Sorry, sorry. And <coughs> rookie mistake, I won't do it again. Um, but it became a point of discussion at the, at the training session, and it was really 
the guidance from uh, MMA was whatever you're doing, just make sure the technology is, is relatively sound, that you're comfortable with it, that you've got somebody to oversee it and make sure that you're not sort of scrambling last minute. And most importantly, that you're able then to meet the open meetings uh, requirements, um, that uh, it's not for our convenience so much as it is, right? Just, um, it, it's nice maybe not to be able to, or have to meet all the time in person, but to make sure that, that you're meeting all those requirements for open meetings. <clears throat> I was just gonna move to adjourn if everybody's done. <laughs> I, I second that I, motion. Okay, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say, I think it's wonderful that we generally have a full complement. I've never seen a problem with us having quorum, and I want to thank you all and congratulate all of us. Meeting adjourned. Do I have to vote on it? Uh, no, I, I, well, I guess you could if you want, and you should gavel. You know, I will. That my next yeah. move was going to. All in favor? All in favor? Thank you. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Thank you.